jump into the uh, community of expertise, putting Unicom resources to, uh, to the test. There's uh, um, three speakers for the plenary session, uh, and we have uh, a number of panelists for the second part where we actually discuss the, um, um, the um, scenarios that, uh, that are there. Um, and uh, we have uh, our three main speakers, Sophia, Derek, and Alexander. And then for the individual scenarios, we have uh, the other people. Uh, I won't mention them all, they, uh, um, but you can see them here. So this is our agenda. We start with the, uh, with, with the main part, uh, introducing uh, the test lab and um, then uh, some discussion and uh, the scenarios that are shortly introduced by the panelists. And we can have discussion on the current and future scenarios at the end of this community of expertise. Well, that's where we are, and I now hand over to Sophia. I think you're still muted, or you have problems with your microphone. Uh, is it working now? Yes, thank ah, you. Okay, sorry. Yes, uh, hello, I'm uh, Sophia Franconi, so I'm with uh, IHE Europe, and today I will explain uh, the Unicom text, Test Lab context and uh, the how IT can uh, can support it. So if you can go to the next slide, please, I would start with uh, what is the, the Unicom Test Lab. So the scope of the Test Lab is to work on specific use cases to advance and demonstrate the practical use of the Unicom's assets. So currently we have uh, five uh, use cases and five self-organized team that will focus each one on um, only one uh, use case. And we have also a um, core team that supports uh, the, can you go to the next slide, please? Sorry. Uh, that supports the different team, thank you, with uh, assets, uh, including tooling, technical support, training, testing, and uh, showcasing. So if you can go to uh, to next slide, uh, we'll see what does the test lab provides. So it provides uh, innovation with prototypes and child uh, learning. It provides also implementability with specification. So we have uh, CDA and Firebase uh, specification uh, strategies and connection to uh, IHE technical committees and mostly IHE uh, pharmacy, but I will uh, come back to that uh, later. And we have also, uh, it provides also governance with um, test scripts, test tools, and uh, mature connectaton and or protectaton uh, processes uh, and events. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so we have currently five uh, use cases in scope. So they will be explained more in detail later, but uh, we have the submission of uh, variation, the updates to the NPD, the NCA to uh, NCPH, the submission in e-dispensation, and the final one, the patient-facing apps. So this use case operationalize uh, workflows along the data pipeline, including the crucial interface between the regulatory use of IDMP and its use in support of care delivery. So in the picture that you see, uh, that was the first face-to-face -face meeting of the test lab uh, teams. So we have practically uh, all of them. It was during the Unicom day at the uh, IT Connectathon. So that's what bring me to uh, to explain to you a little bit what is uh, IT and uh, what is the support that uh, it can bring to uh, to the test lab. So if you go to the next slide, please. So here we can see the mission and strategic goals of IIT that are a bit the same of uh, the one of uh, Unicom. So we see in the missions that uh, it's to reach uh, healthcare interoperability in Europe and the main strategic goal uh, are to uh, transform standards into testable specification and um, help stakeholder and policy makers promote the methodology to foster uh, interoperability. So um, if you go to the next slide, please, um, we'll see the IHE process and uh, where the test lab activities uh, are inserted in, the, in this process. So the IHE method methodology is more than 20 years uh, of uh, experience. 
So everything starts with an interoperability problem faced by a user, and that can engage a vendor. So they're both uh, creating a use case. And if you click, uh, yes. so the, this use case is transformed by uh, the um, IT domain committee in uh, profiles. So in the case of the test lab, that will be the IHC pharmacy uh, domain committee that will transform uh, what we do in the in lab into a profile. So profile is a standard-based uh, detail specification. Then the next step will be, if you can click, please, would be to uh, to have the vendor propose a solution that will be tested in the in the connectaton. So that's a testing event, not only the connectaton, but in this case, that could be uh, uh, the connect add on. And if uh, the the testing uh, pass, uh, the the vendor will have uh, conformance assessment delivered to them. If you click, uh, please. Um, so for the test lab, currently we focused uh, on the profiles, the IG profiles, and how to uh, to explain a use case. If you can go to uh, to the next slide, please. So the five use case participants are leveraging IT interoperability specification format to document their workflow. So um, inside an IT profile. So the IT profile is the, is uh, divided in four uh, volume. So if you click, please, you have the volume one. That's uh, the definition of the use case and workflow in terms of actors and transactions. So that's the first step that we developed with the, the test lab, and that will be uh, in more explained in my next slides. Uh, then uh, we have the volume two, that is the normative definition of the actors and transaction for implementability and conformance uh, testability. The volume three is the definition of uh, data models, and the volume four are the specific extension and requirement for a country or a project. So if you click, please. Uh, so that will be the case uh, for uh, the specific extension for Unicom that will they will be uh, gathered in uh, volume four. So uh, if you go to the next slide, please, that's uh, my last slide. That's a bit how we put this methodology to the um, uh, to have consistency across uh, the different test lab use cases. So with Derek, uh, we created this um, uh, checklist that required, sorry, to have your uh, use case um, implementable, uh, you have to check all the boxes. So you have uh, different information. So the basic information with the description of your use case, uh, the overview of concept, participant, uh, contents, and references. So we explicitly reference supporting our complementary Unicom artifact in our use case description. And then you have for your specific use case, so the introduction, the sequence diagram that will leverage a consistent participant list. So we can see how our use case fits together. And then the narrative description and uh, introduction. So this is the first step that we did with the different uh, use cases. Uh, test lab use cases, and then the following steps are the ones that were in the IT, uh, IT process slides. So now I will leave the floor to uh, Derek that will uh, continue with a presentation on operationalizing the Unicom data pipeline. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sophia. And uh, Robert, if you're able, I prepared it as a video so that it's something that we'll be able to use later. But let's see if we can have this work uh, for the attendees, please. Uh, Robert, I don't hear sound, so I don't know if others do. No. This short video describes how the Unicom Test Lab supports stakeholder workflows along the Unicom data pipeline. My name is Derek Ritz. IHE Europe is a Unicom Consortium member. Its role on the team is to help operationalize the Unicom Test Lab. 
The scope of the lab relates to the whole of the Unicom initiative and all its stakeholders. In this video, we'll particularly focus on regulatory workflows, care delivery workflows, complementary areas of IDMP related value, and finally, the ways the lab can help. Our metaphor for the lab's work is framed around the idea of a Unicom data pipeline. When we describe the pipeline, we intentionally include not only the digital system actors, but the human actors as well. These humans work in industry, at regulatory bodies, digital health agencies, and in the care delivery network. They are the ones who govern their systems, and so they are the stakeholders we need as participants in our collaboratory. Of course, one very important set of humans are the patients. To better serve these stakeholders is the fundamental purpose of Unicom. The key premise of our pipeline metaphor is that our Unicom use cases do not operate in silos. They are interconnected. Each distinct system is connected to upstream data providers and is itself a provider to downstream data consumers. So what does this mean for regulatory workflows? The Unicom Test Lab's gateway workflow is that content needs to be received by regulators. This is literally the beginning of the data pipeline. Pharmaceutical companies make submissions to EMA or to NCAs, and EMA, in turn, shares content to their NCA partners. Leveraging the IHE methodology, this interaction can be described in terms of actor transaction pairs. An IDMP regulatory data sender transmits IDMP regulatory data to an IDMP regulatory receiver. An example of this could be m and company transmitting its Sweet Dreams regulatory submission to the Dutch NCA. Progress has been made regarding this workflow. EMA's PLM portal today is able to create fire messages for some submissions entered using the portal's web forms. We want to build on this progress. To do so, we need to unambiguously define the format of the Firebase dataset and establish the normative behaviors of senders and receivers during the data exchange transactions. As our end game, we want a sender to generate an IDMP conformance submission set that the receiver can natively ingest. Addressing our input issues sets up for our next key workflow. What will be the data outputs from the regulator? How will content be shared to MPD operators or to the infrastructure operators of the national contact points for eHealth? Again, we leverage the IHE methodology to express this in terms of actor transaction pairs. An IDMP MPD data requester retrieves IDMP MPD data from an IDMP MPD data responder. For example, to support safe prescribing, a health app may download Sweet Dreams MPD content from Z-Index, the Dutch MPD. Here we see that the regulatory content model needs to be mapped to the content model that supports care delivery. There is not yet a normative specification for this. We also don't yet have data transformation tools that can map legacy MP content to the IDMP standard nor the quality assurance or quality control stipulations that will ensure this is correctly done. Finally, it is not clear how data sets will be conveyed from NCAs to downstream pipeline consumers, and this should be normatively defined too. As the wellspring of Unicom pipeline data, NCAs have a particularly heavy responsibility. The NCAs outputs are used by every downstream stakeholder. Because of this, the NCAs co-own the interface between the regulatory data model and the care delivery data model. And this is an important thing to get right. Following our data pipeline downstream, what does this mean for care delivery? For Unicom, the key launch event in the care delivery workflow is the creation of an e-prescription. In the cross-border use case, this workflow begins when a care provider in country A creates an e-prescription and saves it to their domestic EHR infrastructure. This is a mature workflow for which we already have conformance testable IEG specifications. As an example, the health app solution plays the role of a content creator. It submits an e-prescription for sweet dreams to the Dutch clinical document repository, which plays the role of a content consumer. 
the e-prescription adheres to the relevant EDSI CDA spec. We could leverage another actor transaction pair to support innovative workflows supported by patient-facing apps or PFAs. For example, a consumer product like My Health PFA could retrieve the Sweet Dreams prescription from the national repository, or maybe from the clinician's EMR, and save it to the patient's mobile phone. One key question related to PFA e-prescriptions is, should they be augmented with the information needed to support a cross-border use case? This is relevant because one of the main Unicom use cases is cross-border dispensing, where the e-prescription created in country A is to be safely dispensed by a care provider in country B. After identifying the patient, this process involves three key workflow steps. The first of these is to retrieve the e-prescription. The relevant actors here are the patient document service consumer and supplier. In our example, the patient has traveled from the Netherlands to Greece. The pharmacist uses their Hella RX app, playing the role of a consumer, to request the patient's prescription list, and then the request is made to the Greek NCP for the sweet dreams prescription the patient needs filled. Now the Greek NCP plays the role of a consumer and requests the prescription from the Dutch NPC. The Dutch NPC transforms the original e-prescription to meet the EDSI content spec and forwards both the original and the transformed version to the Greek NCP. The Greek NCP transforms the EDSI e-prescription into a Greek version and returns the full content set to the pharmacist. Our cross-border use case participants have questions to explore. Are there benefits to generating EDSI content at the time the e-prescription is created? And are there advantages to a common virtual medicinal product approach? And where patients leverage their own app to exchange data with a foreign care provider, do all the same data processing rules still apply? The second key workflow step in our cross-border use case relates to substitutions. Our actors here can be called dispensation options requester and responder. One option, of course, is that the substitution logic is part of the functionality of the pharmacist's app, or there could be a shared service operated as part of the national infrastructure. In some member states, substitution logic is part of the functionality of the MPD. It isn't clear yet what are the implications of each option. Nor is it clear that substitution logic can be normatively expressed in a way that whatever the deployment option, a substitution engine can be conformance tested. The third workflow step is to safely fill the prescription. The e-dispensation has to be shared back to country A. As with step one, the e-dispensation record is transformed by both the Greek and Dutch NCPs as it traverses the infrastructure on its way to country A's EHR repository. There are lessons to learn from the prototyping efforts of our use case partners. The impacts of different data persistence approaches are not yet well understood. There is also not a normative format for expressing content transformation rules or transaction orchestration requirements. And in cases where the patient is the holder of their e-dispensation on their mobile phone, what are the options for flowing the data back to the EHR? What are some of the use cases that are complementary to our data pipeline? The IHE Pharmacy Technical Committee published a profile for capturing barcode content in support of both clinical and supply chain workflows. For many dispensed transactions, a barcode scan will be the key first step. WHO's Smart Guidelines Program and CCG initiatives in Europe, North America, and Asia are showing the value of closing the no-do gap, the sometimes wide chasm between knowledge and practice. With CCGs, our digital health investments can be leveraged to improve adherence to prescribing best practices and reap the patient safety and outcome benefits that come with more consistently operating in the green zone. Our adoption of IDMP as the foundation of the Unicom data pipeline will create truly useful data assets. Helpful guidance, such as is found in the IHE de-identification cookbook, 
can inform how we set up national and perhaps pan-European data holdings. These data sets can support advanced analytics and help us harness the promise of AI. The lab is focused on the practical aspects of bringing the Unicom data pipeline to fruition. We will want to ensure there are deliberate feedback loops that we can use to incorporate lessons learned into future iterations of the digital health standards and specifications we rely on. So how can the Unicom test lab help? The lab's three core value propositions support data pipeline stakeholders at every stage of their development. We will welcome our chance to engage with our Unicom partners and contribute in practical ways. Where there are technical challenges, we can help innovate. Where solution options are in hand, we can help develop interoperability specs ready for implementation at scale. And when it's time to broadly deploy, our testing services can be leveraged as an instrument of governance. There's important work to do. Please, let's do it together. And thank you for watching this video. Alexander, if you want to follow up, uh, or if Derek wants to add something to his video, that's... Uh... I think uh, let's keep to time, Robert. I'm happy to answer questions uh, afterwards, but uh, please, Alexander, bring us home. Okay, so uh, let's try to wrap up a little bit what we, we discussed so far and all these good examples provided by, um, by Derek. Uh, now, uh, let's go to the next slide. So. In, in Unicom, we have been working for many, many uh, uh, years now, almost three years, and we have developed a lot of assets. Uh, Sophia mentioned those. So the, the idea was to create this uh, Unicom test lab to be able to um, connect the dots of all the works that the different teams did and try to use this uh, IHE use case approach to try to work on more concrete uh, things and demonstrate demonstrate the practical use of the different Unicom assets that we have created so far in adapting those to real life scenarios. Also in parallel, we want to promote innovation, implementability and governance, and uh, try to be able to, at the end of the project, to have some of those assets as a feedback to the different SDOs and try to uh, en enforce the global uh, adoption of IDMP. So uh, we have, some use cases that will be described uh, just after after me uh, there. Each team works independently and we try to have some common ways uh, of working in this approach of this uh, Unicom test lab. Uh, it's a combination of online meetings uh, and plenary meetings, but also uh, having some face-to-face -face meetings. So we had a recent face-to-face -face Unicom day uh, during the IHE Connect on Indran in September. And we hope that we will be able to make another second similar face-to-face -face meeting uh, very soon in January 2024 uh, in Athens during the Athens Digital Health Week. So please stay tuned. Information will come up uh, very soon. Now, uh, the Unicom Test Lab is somehow integrated within the organization of the project. So it's a combination of support from the work package that support us in dissemination, but also uh, is um, in support of w work package one, which is coordinating uh, the testing activities and the standardization approach, but also work package six, which was the software factory and a lot of assets were created there. And now we are running a technical help desk and we are supporting uh, this exercise. So the idea is that uh, those Unicom test labs are reusing the, the Unicom assets, but we uh, are keen and willing to contribute and connect with other initiatives and programs and projects. And we already have some of them that we somehow are in, let's say, um, open discussions and they are somehow contributing to these discussions like uh, the Gravitate Health Project, the Gid, uh, the GIDWIG um, approach and also the Pistoia Alliance. So next slide. 
Now, those are the five use cases. I don't want to spend time here. Uh, they will be presented uh, just after in more details. I just wanted to mention here their names. And if you want to reach out and participate or contribute, there are specific people behind each group and that you can talk to directly. Like for the submission of variation, you can reach out to uh, Robert Stigui or Raphael Sergent to the, the update of the uh, MPD, uh, to Esther Pilin and Zaik Ifak, and et cetera, et cetera. The important thing is that we want to create this process and this unicum governance and try to expand it with new future use cases. So please propose, propose send emails to us, get in contact with us for future use cases that you think uh, the IDMP could have a, a role uh, and maybe the proposed methodology by Derek in his video is a way to approach this in a very interesting way. Uh, next slide. So this is more or less how we have organized ourselves. We are trying to have uh, some plenary meetings where we uh, discuss some of these issues. We discuss the progress and we also invite people from the Unicom Consortium to contribute as much as they want. Some teams make more technical meetings and they discuss their use case in more details. We there are a lot of independent team meetings, uh, plus some weekly coordination meetings that we have uh, so that we try to organize a little bit of this. In parallel, we are supporting, uh, like today, the concept of uh, webinars and um, community of expertise, but also our face-to-face -face meetings and that we hope to have at least another two uh, before the project ends. Next slide. So uh, try to make this as a call for action. As Derek mentioned, the idea is that we need more engagement for the Unicom stakeholders and third parties as well. We need to find ways to innovate and reuse the assets of created within Unicom, like the substitution component, the ADMP um, API, and all those things that have been created. And the idea is to try to advance uh, using the IHE methodology from defining the business case to finding specific set of specifications that can be tested and even in the far future also align somehow with conformance testing. So there is a lot of work still going on and everybody's invited to, to join. Next slide. So that's um, an idea of having our next, let's say, face-to-face -face meeting in the week, uh, the Athens is Health Week. So please keep this in your calendars, 15th to 19th of January. And we hope through the Unicom Consortiums to be able to propose more detailed information on that. And for sure, for those that will be also in Ghent, uh, we will for sure by then have a lot more details to announce about how we're going to continue uh, our meetings and face-to-face -face discussions uh, in Athens. Next slide, and I think I'm done. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert, back to you. Yes, thank you, Alexander and Derek and Sophia, of course, for this uh, excellent uh, introduction to uh, the Unicom Test Lab and the IHE methodology that we uh, employ. But it's it's much more than that, as uh, as you saw in the call to action from uh, both uh, Derek and uh, and Alexander, uh, and that's what uh, what we want to use uh, a Mentimeter for, uh, just to get a grip on on where our audience is. Uh, I did see some uh, raised hands. Please note that there's a Q&A uh, uh, that uh, you should be able to use. You cannot use the chat, unfortunately. We want to have just one place to uh, get our questions. Uh, um, but I didn't see any uh, questions uh, getting uh, submitted yet. So please uh, put your uh, questions in the Q&A and we will uh, answer them either live or uh, uh, in, in writing or as part of this discussion, of course. Uh, let me see if I can uh, navigate to the Mentimeter. Uh, if you have a phone or a computer or anything else uh, close by, let's, uh, let's go to menti.com. And this is where the, um, uh, where the code uh, should be. Uh, so menti.com, and if you use the 3644-3798 code, then uh, thinking about the stages that uh, that the call to action that Derek and 
uh, Alexander mentioned, uh, what, wh where would you position yourself with respect to uh, IDMP interoperability and the, and the Unicom data pipeline that, uh, that we're, uh, we're trying to set up through the Unicom project and other projects? Are you in the innovation stage, just looking at what are the scenarios? Are you already exploring how to do that using uh, the assets that are out there, the, the fire implementation guides, etc.? Are you already in implementation mode and uh, do you have systems available to, uh, to actually support that uh, and, and support the interoperability or are you in need of conformance testing? Of course, you can say, well, I have no idea what you're talking about yet, so uh, I don't know. Or you might be representing an organization that does not actually operate uh, systems that need to be interoperable. And in that case, you might uh, click not applicable. We have uh, five people joining us now uh, out of the um, 48 uh, attendees. So I would really like uh, our attendees to join menti.com and use the code that's on your screen. I'll repeat it once more, 36443798, and you will be able to get in and we'll get some ID. It's, it's good to see that we're already at four uh, people that uh, are saying we're in, in implementation mode um uh, of course those people that don't know yet uh we we will make this uh, recording available to you through youtube uh, and uh, that uh, including of course uh, the video that uh, that derek uh, proposed um so that's something that um uh, that we really want to uh, uh, focus on so that you can get uh, a better grip on on where you are and uh, which stage uh, you would be. Um, Catherine Kronaki um, uh, just put a question in the um, Q and A um, about the working group meeting that's uh, held in conjunction with uh, what Alexander mentioned. It's part of the um, uh, Athens Digital Health Week, where the Unicom project will be as well. Uh, the Unicom project will test specifically some of the scenarios that we've developed together with the Gravitate Health project and uh, the Gidewig uh, fire project. Uh, so that's, uh, that's where we, uh, we will be uh, looking at things, but uh, there might be uh, other things uh, going, uh, going on uh, as well. So thank you, Catherine, for pointing that out. Uh, we're getting more implementation and exploration uh, people and only one person that says it's not applicable. If there's any more questions, please put them in the Q&A. And uh, in the interest of time, uh, I, will, I will leave the uh, Mentimeter open for you, but I'll uh, go back to our presentation mode and uh, go into the uh, description of the scenarios. Um, and hopefully I'm going to the right screen yes we're back um and i'd like to ask uh, rafael sergeant to uh, quickly introduce uh, the uh, submission of variations uh, scenario yeah thank you robert hi everybody so i joined the unicom work package one recently and one use case that i'd like to explore now is the submission of variation because that's something uh, we all know is already happening on the electronic application form for the human medicinal products that is located on the PLM portal from EMA. And uh, there is at the moment very little interoperability. You go to the portal, you do your submission, you're done. And basically what we'd like to investigate is how can we make that a bit more interoperable and also uh, make sure that this is benefiting you know, the applicants that could eventually reuse some of the data already existing in their systems. And one very famous one is the RIM system. Not everybody has a RIM system, so hopefully at some stage, uh, all pharma company will have one. But it is already, if you have some data available in your RIM and you need to retype everything by hand on the PLM portal, especially when you do use the control vocabularies from EMA coming from the SPO, um, as you probably know, ready for organization and referential, for instance, <clears throat> then you may benefit of reusing your own information pre-aligned with the SPO information and just electronically submit 
from your RIM system directly to the PLM portal. That could be an interesting thing. Now, from the PLM itself, you know, eventually that you can download the file message that has been uh, created after your submission. And that would be also some useful resources that one could reuse internally. And at the moment, this is barely done because not any, not everybody can read the fire messages, right? So that's indeed something we'd like to explore a little bit more and think about the future, how you would electronically submit things to EMA, for instance, but also electronically receive responses directly. And that could be automated for instance, through the RIM environment. So that's a little bit the, the context of this use case. Now on the next slide, you see a little bit the, the schema around it. So today we have the, the RIM, as I said, kind of the core uh, regulatory information management system. Um, and we do submit things to the PLM portal but we'd like those to be actually automated from the RIM directly through file messages to the PLM portal, not having two human interventions, one at the internal system level and one in an external system level. Ultimately, we'd like everything to be also aligned with the content of documents, because what you ultimately submit into your file message for your variation is nothing new. You already had that or you should have that already into your dossier. So everything that is published and submitted to a combined that uh, electronic submission exists in a form of a paper. Ultimately, one would like that paper and that electronic data to be fully aligned. So to avoid any discrepancies there. Um, and we'd like also maybe on the next click if there is the ontology around it. Exactly. So we'd like to have actually a governance context around it. So you probably heard about the IDMP standards. And if you did not hear about the IDMP ontology, then I encourage you, like Alexander was mentioning before, to reach out to Pistoia Alliance and um, look out for this amazing project to actually create an ontology based on the IDMP standards. So everybody would actually speak the same language. And so by governing every aspect of your internal systems with an external ISO standard, um, then you would ensure that internally you're already in a very good shape and you need very little tweaking for um, your internal information before it goes through your variation submission process. And that's only for variation. We hope in the future we can deploy that a bit further to like renewals, maybe in the first time and maybe uh, also for original submission in a later stage. Speaking about timelines, on the next slide, you see a little bit about the provisional timelines. Um, I'm not gonna go into each and every detail. Of course, one can refer to the slide back and it's also available on the EAF uh, website. Just to alert you, as you can see here, that actually this is going to be shifted most probably to Q1 2024, because um, those timelines are dated from July 2023. And as you can uh, already see, the update for the split on NCAs and CAPs uh, are already uh, delayed a little bit. So that, that's going to shift a little bit on the right to 2024. So I hope this is an international use case. Uh, please stay tuned. Uh, Unicom is going to go back with some uh, examples and uh, application we hope very soon. And I hope to talk to you with an update on that very soon. Back to you, Robert. Or oh, Zane for the next use case. Yes, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So I always like to start off with an example of what we are actually working on. I think Derek mentioned very well that uh, we are looking at a pipeline and data that is used in one part of the pipeline will be reused in a different part. So if the data is different in one part, for example, the example on screen you see, so in Finland, Estonia, Portugal, you have different ways of, of displaying the package size. Um, 
how, how will this information then be uh, represented in 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 cross border examples? Um, so we should make sure that, like the example on the screen, we uh, make sure that the the data from the pipeline gets transferred to different uh, parts. Uh, next slide, please. So I will specifically be talk about the MPDs, the medicinal product dictionaries. Um, they have the task of compiling uh, medical data and uh, specifically to design to support prescription prescription dispensing. Um, and they have different sources of information which they have to compile, uh, which is needed for this uh, specific uh, use case. Um, now they are tasked with getting this data from different sources. This is usually non-structured information and uh, is error prone, is a manual process, so, which means it takes very long. Um, and with the use of IDMP, we would like this data to be standardized, have one structured source of data, um, which would then help with um, having more um, data, which is um, high speed and uh, less error prone. Next slide, please. Um, so then you can ask yourself, why do we not just send all the data the NCAs has to the MPDs? Um, the, what you see in front of you is a screen, and if you can't read all the little boxes, that's kind of the point. Uh, it is a lot of data which uh, the NCAs has compiled for medicinal products, and most of these, not most, but uh, not all of this information is not needed for MPDs. So we can't just say, here is every information, and we can just send it to the MPDs. We should have some specification about how MPDs could access this data, of how the NCS could make sure this data gets transferred to the MPDs. Next slide, please. Um, because uh, we are looking at a lot of regulatory um, steps in the in Unicom, but uh, to make it useful, we should uh, have a discussion how we can make this useful in the clinical data space. So how do we make this bridge from regulatory data to clinical data, which then can be used for use cases, which will be mentioned after mine. Uh, next slide, please. Um, to make it very short and visual, um, this is, uh, in a very simplistic manner, the data flow from EMA and or NCA to an MPD. And we uh, are working on step three, so the, the, the number three, which is the NCA data to MPDs. And this is also our call for if you are in one of these parties, please reach out to Esther Palin or myself to discuss uh, which needs we could include in this use case. Thank you. We're heading now for the third use case. Um, they, the, the, the transactions from the national competent authority, the agency, to uh, the national contact point of eHealth. That's the organization within the country that is responsible for managing uh, eHealth um, in the country, but also the international relationships and for the infrastructure to make the cross border happen. Next. We'll talk about two aspects of um, this um, communication from one organization to the other. First of all, the content, the content quality control of the legacy conversion data for in and from the national competent authority. And secondly, the uh, conformance testing of the transaction of trusted data in the NCAs to the data as they are in uh, the national contact point for eHealth. Let's discuss the first aspect first. Data quality control is limited. We will limit it to the legacy conversion process, meaning the, the um, implementation of IDMP in the older products at the national level, not the central EMA um, processes for the new drugs who are directly between industry and um, EMA. 
and governed by the DALI project. This is about legacy conversion. And we have de developed an instrument, uh, an instrumentarium of sets of requirements, resources, and tools for testing the content quality of trusted data as they emerge from the national competent authorities. And this instrumentarium can be used in different ways. It can be used for quality control by the NCA of legacy conversion data if they are outsourcing this to external providers. It can also be used for internal quality control in the NCA of internally produced legacy conversion data. And finally, the receivers of the information of um, NCA can also use this instrumentarium for external quality control of IDMP compliant trusted data originating from the NCAs, for instance, medical product dictionaries, national contact points of e-health and vendors. All this to, entrust, to ensure the trustworthiness of IDMP data of medicinal product at the national level. We give you some examples. Next slide. These are examples of content quality testing of trusted data. Uh, can we answer the following questions? Are all substances specified that need to be specified? And are meaning is the modifier made explicit? For instance, amlodipine must always have a modifier, either mesilat, basilat, or maliat, but must one of the three must be there. And is it the correct one? And are also the correct codes used? SMS in this case. Are all dose forms correctly expressed as granular EDQM administrable dose form? And if so, are the correct codes used, EDQM or SPOR, or both? Are, and the third question, are all strengths correctly normalized according to the Gitwick business rules? Which is not a simple issue, which is not, these rules are not completely stable yet, but will soon be published officially. And it's no surprise that these three examples um, cons constitute the key quality issues for making a PHP ID on a global level. Next slide. When we come to the second aspect, transferring trust data on medicinal products from NCAs to the national contact point. Uh, there are two methods to do so. Either the national competent authority can send out a file, and it can be a structured file, an unstructured file, a file a message, and that can then follow be imported by the national e-health contact point. Or the nation can decide to work with an online transaction platform where the agency refreshes this databases with uh, the correct trusted and um, IDMP data, and the national health point, contact point can get these data through APIs. Next slide. Whatever the method of transferring the data is, at the given point, you have to compare the trusted data as they are inside the ICT systems of the NCA with the data as they are in the national contact point of eHealth. And there, they, these data for the, to govern the e-prescription uh, processes are stored in HL7 CDA templates. And we have to see whether the transactions between these two systems work well, and whether the data are on both sides of the sending and receiving uh, and are conformant. And we are now collecting examples of, um, of uh, sets of data in the NCA and sets of data in the HL7 CDA to see whether these are conformed. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, and we should have Angela next. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, this is the use case of uh, cross-border, uh, including sub substitution in uh, a dispensation. Please, next slide. Okay, so uh, 
Okay. So the purpose of this use case is to facilitate the exchange uh, of the prescription between the country of affiliation to the country of treatment. And in particular, a citizen to go into a pharmacy with a prescription, the purpose of use case is to guarantee the supply of medicine and also the continuity of the, the cure. So please, next slide. The context in which uh, the use case uh, uh, work is the HDSI and in particular way the IDMP because uh, the idea is to standardize the medicine and uh, also uh, to um, coding with the, the IDMP. So we want to underline the non-technical factor that are legal regulatory uh, requirements and privacy and data protection because it's important that the, the, the patient uh, uh, give the um, the consent to the re requirement uh, and uh, uh, legal factor and also the part that are technical because uh, uh, if we want to uh, find the substitution medicine the idea is to have the substitution rules please next slides Okay, now um, for the use case uh, we uh, designed the, the, the process flow uh, the patient that move from the country A, so the country of affiliation, to the country B, that are the country of treatment uh, for different reasons, and needs to a cure, uh, go to the, the pharmacy and the e prescription of the patient move from the country A to the country B. Uh, the dispenser uh, uh, read the e prescription and uh, uh, examine if uh, um, there are or not the correct medicine. If uh, in the country B there aren't uh, the, um, the correct medicine, so the country B applied the substitution rule and the national requir uh, requirement, and uh, uh, try to find an alternative medicine that can be dispensed. So uh, after this process, uh, if the dispenser uh, find the correct medicine, uh, go to the patient, uh, um, the necessary de uh, detail, and if the patient accept the, su the substitution rule and the uh, national requirement, uh, the dispenser dispense the substitution medicine. So uh, next slide, please. In this uh, in this slide, we can find we can find the cross border process that are the the same process for the e uh, prescription that was uh, uh, exchanged from country A to the country B and uh, the IDMP minimum attributes that describe the, the the medicine. After the uh, moving from the country A to the country B, the a prescription the dispenser created the dispensation and moved the a, uh, dispensation from the country B to the country A. Please, next slides. In these slides, there are the challenge, but why we want to uh, have the substitution? Because the, the, the idea is to include the substitution in uh, e dispensation because there are a lot of brands, a lot of uh, um, um, companies that create the same uh, medicine. The idea and the uh, there are uh, uh, the possibility that in the country um, there isn't the, 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 the correct medicine. So um, the idea is to identify the equivalent with a different, uh, different rule and we can uh, dispense the substitution medicine from the country A to the country B and uh, from the country B to the country A. Um, okay, so next slide. So we want to only to uh, explain what we're doing uh, with the Greece and Belgium. We create uh, ADB with uh, four uh, substances: amlodipine, carbamazepine, ibuprofen, and simvastatin, in which we have uh, codified the uh, medicine with the different attributes in IDMP. And uh, uh, for the creation of the prescription, we exchange the prescription, uh, e -e -prescription uh, from this uh, discount to understand if the 
um, substitution rule uh, can be used and uh, can the, the country be um, dispenser the correct uh, medicine. So that's all in the next slides. Uh, we put also the asset uh, that we use uh, in, from the Unicum project for the creation of e this use case. Please next slide. There are the male, so the minimum attribute list. Uh, that are present this table in which we use uh, the different attributes for the creation of uh, um, uh, codify uh, list of medicine and wave six, so the IDMP. That's all. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Today I will present to you a new case that related to the patient facing apps. Please, next slide. So this use case helps test the usefulness of IGMP standards for the univocal identification of medicinal products using a private sector reward scenario. In particular, AMES demonstrates the possibility for a patient that lives in country A who is traveling abroad without their medicine to obtain a similar substitute medicine in country B to safeguard health and ensure adherence to treatment. Next, please. So Unicom projects provide to, to patients three different applications with all the same functionalities. The applications are Pharma Wizard for Unicom, Heal Pass, and InfoStage. Functionalities are the ability of searching for medicine to gain information about them, the ability of adding medicine to a patient's medication list, the possibility of create a medicine data QR code that needs to be shown to pharmacies in, 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 to make them able to find a good substitute drug. And then the ability of adding the identified substitute drugs to the medication list. Next slide, please. So with the patient facing app, the user is able to create a medication list in order to save his own drug in the mobile device generate a QR code for the healthcare provider app to communicate with the pharmacist about the drug that needs to be substituted. And in the end, add the substitute drug to the medication list to the record the pharmacist's choice. Next slide, please. Unicom also provides an application for the care professionals, in particular, pharmacists. And with this app, the pharmacist is able to scan the patient-facing app QR code then is able to connect with the substitution component of the Unicorn server to reach a list of equivalent substituted drug to make him available, able to make the most appropriate choice. And at the end, is also able to generate a new QR code that contains the substitute drug data and the information that needs to be sent back to the patient facing app. Next slide, please. So to recap, with the healthcare provider app, the pharmacist is able to scan the patient facing app generated QR code to obtain a list of similar medication and also their characteristics. View the medication the patient is currently taking through the medication list only if the patient wants to. Consult a list of potential substitute medication in order to select the best substitute medication for the patient and at the end, generate a QR code that needs to be sent back to the patient facing app in order to inform the patient of the medication chosen. Next slide, please. So in the use case that I present to you, the scenario is simple. We have a patient that is living in country A who is traveling abroad in country B. At this point, he selects a medication from the medication li list that needs refilling. At this point, with the app, is able to generate the QR code related to this drug that needs to be shown to the pharmacist. The pharmacist, with the help of the care provider application, can read this QR code to send information through the app to, a Unicom, to the Unicom database. And at this point, he can receive back, thank you to the substitution component, a list of similar medication available in country B. At this point, the man in the loop, that is the pharmacist, make an informed choice about the good substitute drug and can generate a good QR code that needs to be sent back to the patient facing app. The patient, the patient that, is, uh, that lives in country A uh, but is now in country B can gain information about the similar medication available in country B. Next, please. 
So in all my slides, I talk about QR code and you need to know that the QR code is the way with which data are represented. The QR code contains two keys, the medication key, which contains the information about the user selected medication. And then we have the substitution key, which contains the information about the substitute medication selected by the healthcare provider. So you can see that the QR code generated by the patient facing app contains only the medication key, but the substitution key is null. The QR code generated by the healthcare provider app contains both medication key and the substitution key. Next slide, please. So now I will present to you the patient that is involved in our demo. And in the next few slides, I will present how the demo will be performed. So our patient is Harry. Harry, that is a Greek boy of 45 years old that suffers from hypertension. And for this reason, in his medication list, is present amlodic in five milligrams. Next slide. During an unexpected extended stay in a foreign country, Harris is in need to refill amlodipine. So thanks to the HEALTH pass, PASS is able to show the pharmacist the QR code generated for the drug needed. Next slide. This is the same scenario using the PharmaWizard for Unicom app. So using this app, you can show the pharmacist the QR code for the drug needed. Next slide. The pharmacist can recognize that the medicine comes from a foreign country. So thanks to the healthcare provider app, he can identify the similar medicine marketed in this country. And he can show the patient the new drug. Next. Using eHealth Pass, the patient can scan pharmacy's QR code and that distract the medication list. Next. And same story, but using PharmaWizard for Unicom, the patient can scan the pharmacy's QR code and add this drug to the medication list. So in the next slide, I think that there is our demo video that was recorded in REN in the Connectaton. Thanks. So I'm supposed to be like 45 years old and have hypertension. Yeah, I feel like one, so could be. Um, I have my medication list and I'm going to choose um, Lodipin. And here I will generate my QR code, which I will show to my pharmacist in Italy. Oh, you, you see our mobile on the screen, yeah. But now we, are, we need to swap to see what the pharmacist will do. The medication that the patient has selected and uh, I can see all the information and now and now I can generate a list of similar medicine. Okay. This is the list provided by the substitution component. I will select the first one. And then I will generate the cure code that need to be shown to patients. So now I bear the chance, but I have already scanned the QR that was generated earlier. And as you see here, I have the option to see my dispensed drug, which in our case was this Norvas tablet, 10 milligrams. So I know that initially I was, I was prescribed to get uh, amlodipine in Greece, but in Italy, I couldn't find the same drug. So they, prescribed, they gave me this one. So I have this in my history now. And moving on back to the case that someone comes in Greece. Okay, this is the Pharma Wizard for Unicom in uh, Italian. We have the list of medicine. As you can see, I have amlodipine, Italian amlodipine, and I will share it with my pharmacist. I will, I have all the information I can generate the QR code. Something okay, and I got it. It's the same thing, so we will show the, what happens on the directly. So, yeah, 
I choose load it in 10 milligrams from Greece and I generate my QR. Should work, yes. I can add it to my You can see I have it in my. So this was the end of the video. Nicole, anything yes. to add? Yes, it's the end also of my presentation. Thanks. Okay. So I'm supposed to be like... Oops. Then those were the five scenarios that uh, we promised you. And uh, we can uh, continue on. Uh, there's a, a question already in the Q&A on uh, the future of the patient, uh, patient app and the medication list. Um, and uh, I'll also switch over to the um, Mentimeter or switch back to the Mentimeter. And uh, actually we see one respondent uh, that is already in conformance testing. So we really like to get to know you. This uh, Mentimeter is anonymous. Uh, so if you want to identify yourself through either the Q&A or by taking direct contact with, uh, with uh, Unicom, uh, Derek in particular, uh, that that would be wonderful. So that we know uh, where to where to go with uh, with this one. Um, so that was the previous question. Uh, I want to move on to the uh, to the next uh, question, and um, just explaining what uh, what Zen uh, introduced and uh, and also what was in Derek's uh, presentation. Uh, there's a really important transition uh, in, um, in in the data pipeline from the regulatory uh, data to the clinical context in a particular country. And we've seen that also in uh, the substitution component where we really need to uh, to look at uh, what's what's going on. Uh, and the question here is who should provide that data transition from regulatory to clinical in your country? It might be different from country to country. We didn't ask what country you're uh, you're coming from, uh, so uh, we don't know what uh, what that will do. But it could be either the national competent authority that has to make that transition to uh, actually make the uh, data uh, um, useful within the clinical context. Could be the uh, national uh, contact point for e-health or the e-health agency. Uh, in your country that needs to uh, to work on that. It could be the MPD, uh, the Medicinal Product Database Provider. Sometimes the National Comp Competent Authority is al also providing the Medicinal Product Database, uh, but it could also be part of the medication management module of your electronic health record system or whatever you're using, either in your pharmacy or in your hospital. Um, of course, there uh, I think there was meant to be another category, but I'm not sure whether that actually uh, showed up. If not, then uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, we apologize uh, for that. There's only 12 out of our 36 attendees uh, that are logged into Mentimeter. Um, I have no idea what what's going to happen uh, if I if I still have the Mentimeter. Uh, yes, uh, I just send you the link in the uh, in the chat for those of you who want to participate. Um, so this is uh, what's going on. And please, the Q&A is also open. Um, so uh, this uh, picture reinforces the role of the National Competent Authority uh, in, in order to actually uh, provide uh, the transition from regulatory to clinical context. Uh, and. Uh, that that should be an interesting one uh, to see how that uh, that that is then also supported in terms of the data pipeline uh, and the uh, actual inter, uh, interoperability between the, the the systems downstream. Um, so that's uh, that's a very interesting uh, one. Okay, um, we did provide you with uh, with a number of uh, scenarios uh, to which this question is of course. Uh, very instrumental to make that happen. Um, but we would like also to hear from you whether you see any other scenarios that we need to uh, look into. Um, if you, uh, I, 
I'm not sure whether you can move uh, yourself, but I'll go to the next slide with you and uh, we'll see what, uh, what happens uh, next. So um, what other scenario would you like to work on in the Unicom test lab? Uh, there's, um, this is just a short, uh, short answer. Um, so, um, and, and we, we will, as Esther uh, mentioned, uh, also open up mics for people who want to uh, explain what, uh, what responses they're, uh, they're working on and uh, what, what scenarios they would like to work on. So we can actually uh, move, uh, move ahead and then get a feeling for, uh, for what, uh, what other use cases we need to address because we kind of picked up the ones that are really key to the different assets and the different resources that have been developed over the past years uh, in the Unicom project. And, uh, and there might be needs out there uh, to, to actually uh, come up with uh, different uh, scenarios. So just to give you uh, an overview, we, uh, we did have the uh, submission uh, variance, uh, variation submission scenario. We did have the um, scenario to actually move it uh, from uh, the NCA to the MPD. Uh, but also uh, from the NCA to the National Contact Point for eHealth. Uh, we did look at substitution uh, component for cross-border, and we did look at uh, patient-facing apps. I see the, uh, the IPS and the link to EPI. Adverse events is, is also a very interesting one to, uh, to look at. Um, that, that's in our landscape, uh, really the... Um, uh, the end uh, of of, uh, of the regulatory uh, process, where people actually uh, um, uh, report their uh, uh, outcomes uh, and actually look at uh, uh, well what what happened with this drug and if anything wrong uh, bad happened um, that needs to be uh, collated at uh, and, and monitored uh, on a global scale through pharmacovigilance, of course. Uh, integration with CDs, uh, CDS, uh, I'm not sure what CDS, uh, oh, Derek knows what CDS is. Please, Derek, speak up. Uh, for those of you that uh, um, might know, that's a project that I've been engaged with uh, for some number of years with WHO and with some others, the Computable Care Guidelines or Clinical Decision Support the uh, expressing of what would be best practices regarding medications management um, in a computable artifact uh, that can then be uh, executed by clinical decision support systems is, I think, just a fantastic opportunity. And uh, I'm very happy. I put in our, in our host's chat that my little Canadian heart is warmed by seeing two references to clinical decision support and computable care guidelines. Uh, for all of our countries, uh, you know, medications errors are one of the top sources of medical errors and the ways that we can leverage our digital health investments to start to um, address that as a, as a challenge is just terrific. And uh, I think that the, uh, the adoption pan-European wide of, uh, of IDMP gives us some tools in our toolbox to help uh, improve our medications management and leverage our investments in digital health to, to do that better. And I, I think uh, people saw that I had that, the graphic of, uh, of the overlapping Venn diagrams. If the blue circle is everything you should do and the yellow circle is everything that you did do, uh, the game is to try to maximize the size of the green zone. And uh, I, I love to see references to uh, <laughs> the computable guidelines and, and uh, CDS. There you go. I gushed, Robert. I'm sure you were expecting I would. <laughs> no problem. And uh, of course, the EPI is uh, is a very much a part of the uh, the electronic product information. Uh, I should say because there's it might be many other EPIs. That's uh, very much uh, uh, the topic of the Gravitate Health uh, project, uh, which is. Uh, Kind of a companion, or at least well, we're we're aligned, and we have a uh, work, and we have been working together uh, from the start uh, between the Unicom and the Gravitate Health project. Electronic product information, Gravitate Health is actually uh, developing uh, the uh, electronic patient information uh, 
uh, standard um, uh, that, that kind of breaks down the uh, patient leaflet, uh, patient information leaflet in an electronic form so that it can be filtered uh, also. Um, and uh, we do have uh, Catherine as one of the key people uh, uh, from the Gravitate Health uh, Project uh, with us today. So that's uh, that's good. Um, I, I think, Robert, the, uh, the reference to IPS is also speaking a little bit to what um, one of Catherine's questions was in the Q&A. How do we get information? If we're, if we're leveraging patient-facing apps, how do we get that information back into our digital health infrastructure, the national infrastructure? And it's interesting to see the role IPS might be able to play as a two-way communications tool. And I say that because there was some very interesting stuff that uh, happened recently at a fire event where ePatient Dave was uh, leveraging barcodes or QR codes, I think, as, as a, a way to um, codify some of his patient summary information. And where that can be become a, a two-way street, there's an interesting opportunity there. It's uh, the consumerization of some of our, our health workflows is perhaps holding promise for how some of these uh, patient-facing apps can get content back into the infrastructure. Over. Thanks. Well, we're uh, almost at the end of our uh, community of expertise. Uh, I did uh, put a link to our evaluation uh, form in, uh, in the chat. Uh, and actually, uh, I inadvertently shared it on the screen as well. My apologies for that. Um, there's still some uh, uh, room for questions. If you want the mic, uh, please uh, raise your hand and we'll see if we can uh, uh, open up your, uh, your mic for any questions. Uh, we still have uh, some time uh, left and of course uh, the call to action is still out there. Um, please join us for the collaboratory uh, as we like to uh, to consider the, the name or at least uh, the feeling that we got. It's not just a test lab, it's, it's really going through these stages of innovation, exploration, implementation, certification and uh, an actual, uh, well, deployment uh, at scale. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's the, uh, the important part that we're trying to support from the Unicom test lab and, uh, and hopefully uh, together with the uh, uh, IHE Europe and uh, an IHE Catalyst and the other SDOs that are uh, contributing to Unicom uh, right now, we will be able to, uh, to keep it uh, alive and kicking uh, beyond the project uh, duration. Uh, and maybe into a future project that uh, continues uh, the important work to be done in uh, on medication safety. Uh, let's see if we can get Catherine to speak up. Yes, go ahead, Catherine. Um, this was a very impressive demonstration, and I really appreciate it. Uh, congratulations to the team, the way that they um, structured uh, the QR code. Uh, because I think uh, uh, this is an important element of how we move forward and how we align gradually with uh, SPOR, the implementation of EMA, and also appropriate implementation in FDA. I saw that um, the team had included um, the substance, the dose form, etc. Um, how how do they see this uh, scaling up and moving to the next stage? of where we will be using some more um, standard ways of expressing uh, substances, those forms and strength. That's my question. Thank you. Now, who from the speakers and our panelists want to take on at least a first attempt at an answer? Robert. You're on mute, sorry. Yeah. Um, well, Catherine, as you know, the debate is still a little bit on. Um, normally, the International Council of Harmonization has proposed for those form the ADQM um, terminology to be the standard for the implementation of IDMP and for the construction of the uh, PHPID. Um, WHO Uppsala, who is a global mission, has encountered some 
um, resistance from other parts in the world uh, because EDQM is a complex terminology. It's a very granular ter terminology, 428 um, substance um, uh, values in the in the value set, and um, so there have been proposals also from the FDA to um, apply simpler systems based on combinations of the characteristics of um, um, of the ATQM dose form, which would reduce the granularity um, about reducing it to half, more or less. Um, FDA is also proposing this because then they would come much closer to the existing granularity of Eric's norm in the US. And um, well, the debate is still on. Um, in my opinion, ADQM is um, a very efficient, well structured uh, list of standard terms with definitions and characteristics. Um, it is not easy to, to apply it, but it's not impossible. And uh, it should remain, in my opinion, the um, international standard. Anyone else wants to jump in? Actually, if Catherine, if Catherine's mic is still live, is that is that the question you were trying to answer, Catherine? Uh me answering it was my question it was I, no I, no no is that is that an answer to the question that you uh that you anticipate oh, it's it's part of the question uh i think uh, i was looking more of the next uh, low-hanging fruit because it's not only uh the dose forms but there is also the substances um and uh and the strengths so these are all parts of the qr code as we very nicely so in the presentation so i was thinking how this uh, unicom specialized case can be scaled up to be uh, the reference uh, solution well, one of the things that i think is probably going to be very exciting in the near term ab about this whole idea is how much it speaks to uh, a, a wave of patient empowerment so I know I've known ePatient Dave since I think 2010 or something like that. And he was a voice in the wilderness at that point in time. But now the number of people that want to be able to engage in their own healthcare and want to be able to leverage digital tools to do that is uh, it's, it's a bit of a groundswell. And so some of these things, there's technical issues as uh, Bob was saying that have to be figured out. And regardless of, of, uh, uh, whether or not it's a patient-facing app or whether or not it's a, a pharmacy system or an electronic medical record system that a, a care provider is using, we're all going to have to follow follow the rules. But it will be very interesting to see how, um, how I think this can become a two-way street in the coming years. And some of these patient-facing apps will find that uh, they will be not only uh, looking for but expected to have uh, the ability to feed content back into... Uh, uh, back into the the care infrastructure, uh, I I still think that there are some things to figure out, and that's one of the reasons why myself and others have been advocating that the lab will be um, a source of innovation as well. There's when, when we're going to go to scale with some of these things, implementability is going to be a hugely important factor, uh, and that's especially true when we're going to expect patient facing apps to be connecting into the infrastructure. One thing I'd like to add to that is uh, that, that we will be uh, testing uh, or we're exploring uh, the, the, the possibility to test uh, not not scanning uh, a barcode from the uh, or the QR code from the pharmacy system or the pharmacy healthcare, healthcare provider app, but trying to actually scan the uh, the GTIN, the barcode on the box uh, and see what happens then. And how we navigate from the barcode mm -hmm. on the box to uh, to the uh, individual uh, medication that's uh, that's out there. So that's that's something that we're looking into, especially for the Fire Connectathon uh, in in Athens. So uh, and that's uh, probably my uh, last remark uh, in, in closing this session. Please join us in Athens. The Unicom Test Lab will be there. Uh, and there will be uh, more things going on also with the Fire Connectathon, 
uh, with the uh, Gravitate Health and Vulcan Accelerator. Uh, so uh, there's an excellent chance to meet us uh, and to uh, actually uh, get the collaboratory going. So thanks to all the speakers. Thanks to our audience to, uh, for engaging uh, with us today. And uh, see you next time for our next community of expertise.